Hello friends, it's your monk back for another video. I hope you're well and thriving. <clears throat> I hope your practice is doing well. So today I'm going to answer a question uh, uh, from my Telegram chat group. Um, I've had a, two questions. One was about a thing called Hiri Otapa. Hiri meaning sh having shame, engage, you know, uh, like a healthy sense of shame about wrongdoing. And otapa is the actual fear of wrongdoing. And in this case, this is one of the healthy fears. It's not one of the bad fears. Um, and the other question is, can intellectual awareness or something, intellectual awareness stop transmigration? Okay, so transmigration, correct me if I'm wrong, in this context is talking about uh, being reborn, reincarnation, something like that, um, and intellect, the intellectual awareness or intellectual faculty. Okay, so let's go into this. Like, there's a there's a discourse called Vipassana Bhumi, right? So the Buddha talks in this one talks about all the different faculties, right? There's all the different. There's the eye faculty, the ear faculty. Uh, there's the critical faculty, intellectual faculty, but there's the wisdom faculty, there's the knowing faculty, there's the ignorance faculty, I suppose. Um, all these faculties of mind that exist, all these states of mind, right? So if you liken it to uh, like a normal day in your life, for example, you go through different states of mind and you, we put on different hats as people, right? So for example, when you talk to your mother or father, or you talk to your children, or you talk to your brothers, or your friends, or you're at work and you're engaging with different people, like maybe an influential person, or a boss, or an employee, or a customer, or uh, potentially someone that can cha help you change your life or give you opportunity, things like this. It's kind of like we do wear different hats with different people. We have different states of mind, right? So in meditation, the, we talked about in samadhi, concentration, I should say, we talk about right samadhi is having the four jhanas, right? Now the four jhanas remain elusive and not many people talk about those because we always relate, we always go back to how the Buddha explained jhana in the, in the text, right? And what the text explained as, but how, what the Buddha talked about jhana in person perhaps is not written down and I think there's a lot of things not written down because what is fact is also Nalanda University was burnt down right it was burnt down by uh, uh, certain groups okay um, and I believe there was a lot of things a lot of books in there a lot of information in there that was lost right so in books right you can only write so much so like they say, the, these are all the Buddha's words from Ananda's memory. Sure, I'm sure they were, but I'm sure there's things missing there too. And there's also things that are missing there um, that will, can never be in books is experience and what people see. Like what you see, just look at your own life, for example, and what you see throughout the day, what you experience every moment of the day. It's very hard to collate that in a book. You'll never finish a book if you try to do that. That's why, you know bios and all books they're, they're I guess they're just references point references and they're summaries but to engage you know, I'm not saying the discourses aren't relevant and they're not they're not right I'm sure they are but I'm saying in, in there's there's we need to understand the reality between experience and written word right and that's why a living Sangha is important a living teacher is important because there's the verbal experience but also there's that that when, when you engage with another human being, there's that experience that is different from the book, right? So that's hard to capture in a book, right? <clears throat> but we talk about the eight jhanas. Now, the jhanas um, are different states of mind, are different states of chitta, you could say. And they also, when you enter different states of mind, they also have an effect on the brain and the six senses as well. So essentially, when you're in a normal state of mind, like when you're just in default mind, Right, so let's just take a normal day. Um, you get out of bed. You 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 know you go to the bathroom. You clean yourself up. You sit down for breakfast. You prepare for the day. I'm talking in lay terms, and then we'll talk in monk monk terms. 
you know, like where you switch gears when you go into work or, or, or have different. So the thing is, is the, the states of mind change. They just switch gears all the time, right? So jhana is a very concentrated state of mind, right? It's just a very concentrated state, which is different from the, the general kind of state of mind. I guess the default kind of state of mind, right? Now these things, um, these things are important to understand because when we talk about intellect, the intellect, right? It's not that the intellect is um, something bad. It's not that. It's just that it's part of the sixth sense framework, right? And it's just, it's just like the normal thinking process which the intellect takes in when we study. But samadhi, concentration, and sati, awareness, they're two different things because you're actually going deeper into concentration and making the mind still, steady, and less distracted, right? And that takes you into a different state of concentration. But even then, right, usually awakening doesn't occur in concentration, usually. And I mean, we got, I said it, I just touched on it briefly in the last video about Ananda, Venerable Ananda, who, by the way, heard in the last 20 years when he was uh, being Buddha's attendant, right? Buddha's upatar. Uh, he memorized basically every teaching the Buddha taught, every discourse. And that's, it's thanks to Venerable Ananda that we have uh, the Pali Canon today, right? But the thing is, even with having heard all those discourses, Thousands of discourses, right? Many, many hours with the Buddha. There was one thing that was lacking that helped him realize. And, and, and he did that when he was about to lie down and just let it all go. So that didn't happen when he was in Samadhi. And, it, and, and I don't think the intellect had anything to do with that. You may disagree. You may agree with me. You know, we can talk about it. We can discuss it. You know, I'm not 100% sure myself. But it was the fact that he just finally let go. You know, and letting go is deep, you know, it's not something just let go. And <clears throat> to be able to do that was that he, he just, he made a determination, okay, I'm not going to think about it anymore. I'm not going to think about anything anymore. I've done all the work. I don't really don't know. I'm at my wit's end. I've done everything. I don't understand why <clears throat> I haven't been able to realize, right? He said something like this and, and he said, so for now, I'm just going to drop it all. I'm not even going to think about it. So where does that, you know, so that's part of intellect, it's part of not, but it's also part of just <clears throat> going into the void, I guess, right? And when we talk about nama and rupa, nama rupa pachaya, nama rupa conditioned, as in the paticca samupada, with the nama rupa conditioned, then uh, salayatanam, right? Salayatanam comes to be. What's salayatanam? The sixth sense basis, Right? So we've got something before that kind of, you know, we've got consciousness and fabrications, and then we've got a vidya. So the the mystery of all this is how to how to get underneath a vidya and pull pull the root out, pull the pull the uh, that ignorance out, right within. How to clear the cloud, so to speak, right? So this kind of thing, uh, this kind of thing <clears throat> requires the development of all the eight factors. So the intellect, it starts at intellect, but you build onto it. It's not that you drop the intellect, right? It's not that the intellect is something bad or evil and you don't use it. No, you use it, but you hone it more skillfully as your concentration gets better and your sati gets better and your right views become, uh, I guess, more calibrated, <clears throat> more calibrated and, and, and more in line. Right with right views, your right views, your views become in line with the right views, and the other thing is the right sankapo, right? Sama sankapo, your right renunciation or right resolve, like doing no harm, renunciating the well, you know, that's important too. A lot of people want to try to not renunciate the world and not follow the the moral path and think, you know, I'll just read discourses and that's it. No. So, I mean, reading discourses and all that, like I touched before, that's all relevant, but at some point practice comes into it, right? So, so whether the intellect, by intellect alone, we can stop transmigration. 
Well, I guess after you've done the practice, perhaps it does. I don't know. It's hard to say because I have not cut off all the kilesa. I have not uh, reached that stage myself. So I, it's hard for me to say. I can only go by references like everybody else. But I doubt the Noble Eightfold Path is solely intellect. Uh, or it's a very refined, refined intellect. But then here's the thing, right? In in a lot of cases, the Buddha says, mano, right? For example, in the in the fire discourse, mano, <clears throat> which is mind in this case, and I think it's he's talking about mind of the six sense basis, <clears throat> because chitta, he calls chitta chitta and mano mano, and I think mano is is referring to the six sense based thinking, and chitta being chitta. So there's a diff there's a distinguishing there's a distinguishing difference between these two things, right? But he calls mano is on fire and dhamma is on fire in that context. If you read that discourse, the fire discourse, right? So coming back to uh, coming back to mano, right, and coming back to intellect, right? You've got the six sense bases, then you've got chitta, and then you've got the wisdom faculty itself, the knowing faculty. And what occurs before realization <clears throat> so you go into a different state of mind so, so to speak so it's all a build-up it's like i think what it is is you need all of it you need all of it to be skillful to to give you the final answer i think you need everything you need the jhanas now the jhanas is always in, up in debate because there are people that argue that you only need the first jhana due to uh, uh i think it was an under saying the first jhana is the most important thing um, and there are those who who insist that you need the fourth jhana. You need to be able to develop fourth jhana in order to realize. This is a back and forth argument. Whichever the case, even if you can get into first jhana, that's a huge accomplishment in itself because that requires that's a deep level of concentration, a deep level of cutting off, right? And that's talking about chitta focus as well, right? <clears throat> so, I guess it's uh, unlocking. The connection, uh, the disconnection, I suppose, between chitta and six sense basis, and going beyond the six sense basis, right, and going backwards, uh, as in Paticca Samuppada, right, going instead of saying staying in the six sense basis, you go through Nama Rupa, back through Vijnana, back through Sankara, back through Avijja, and into Avijja, something like that, right. So you know, guys, it's it's a, it's art, it's science. It's work, it's effort, diligence, all put together. You know, don't stop trying to look for the silver bullet. Ananda tried that. And I mean, let's face it, Ananda heard the Buddha was there. He was the Buddha's attendant. He, he, he waited on the Buddha. He served the Buddha. He heard all the Buddha's teachings. <clears throat> and yet, at 80 years of age, right, after 20 years, could not enlighten, right, could not realize. And he was a monk on top of that, right? So I'm just using Venerable Ananda's case in, in this one. Then you have other things, other other cases where, you know, someone who hears, like, for example, like I touched on the other video as well, the first five disciples heard two discourses. But you've got to ask yourself, why were they be able to, why were they able to realize only having heard two discourses? So there had to be some cultivation and development to begin with. There had to be something, there had to be some kind of development, I suppose. The other mystery that will we'll probably none of us will never know, <clears throat> not in this life anyway, is being sitting in front of a Buddha and having a, the actual Samasam Buddha teach you, right? You know, the significance of that is huge. I mean, I think, I think that goes a long way. Uh, <clears throat> and, uh, you know, if you've got that merit, if you've got that... Uh, you know, if you got that chance, right, and it and it comes, and you've done and you and you've done your work, you've done a lot of cultivation and development, then you know, I don't think it gets much better than that, right? In terms of being a disciple of the Buddha, so these these things all all come into play. So it's not so simple, right? We have this, uh, you know, prime, you know, schoolyard man, mathematical principle that we all, you know, we are all got. In, brainwash with that one plus one equals two you're always trying to hone it down to the formula that's going to give you the magic trick right but it, it's it you know it goes beyond mathematics because we're talking about wisdom we're not talking about logic wisdom is further than is further down the path than logic 
So keep that in mind, right? So the next thing, so that hopefully, you know, that answers that question. I hope I answered it well, and I hope, uh, I hope it clarifies some things. You know, bottom line, <clears throat> do your work. Do the work. Do the work. Do the work. Eventually, hopefully, like Ananda, one day, um, I mean, for Ananda to be able to, say, to finish this, for Ananda to be able to get to the point where I'm just going to leave it alone. But first of all, he'd done a lot of work. He'd done all the work first. Right, so when you get to that point when you've done all the work and you just say, well, you know, stuff this, I don't, I really don't, I'm at my wits end, I don't know what else to do. <clears throat> That's a pretty qualified statement. But if you haven't done the work and then you say, well, stuff it, I don't, I'm not, I'm at my wits end, I don't know what else to do, then you, that's not qualified. You're not qualified because you haven't put in the effort, the the due diligence, you haven't put in the required effort to, and 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 so. You're not at that point where you can say, well, I've done everything. You know, I've looked at every angle of this and I just don't know where else to go. So it's very different, you know, what Venerable Ananda did. And some people try to, you know, they say, well, I've tried to meditate for 10 years and I'm still not there. Well, you know, you just maybe you just tried to meditate for one hour. Like how long do you sit every day? But what about the other factors? What's your right resolve? You know, what's your right livelihood? What's your right views? What's your right effort? What's your speech like? You know, what's your actions like? You know, what's your awareness like? What's your sati like? What's your concentration level like? Question yourself on all the factors, not just one. Not just one. You know, just thinking all the time, trying to find a bullet or shortcut it. There's no shortcut to this. Right? There's no shortcut to this. Pretty much if you look at the story of nearly every arahant, right? If you look at the background story, you see that they all did a certain amount of work. It wasn't just ad hoc. Now I'm going to antagonize myself and hypocrite myself on purpose. They're one of uh, Ajahn Man's, Acharya Man's, uh, I think the most eldest disciple, Lompo uh, Tun, he, he released, he, he spoke about how there's the school of thought in terms of parami, in perfections, that you need every perfection before you can realize. And then he said, that's nonsense. You don't need any of that because chitta is there and you can realize at any time. All right? So that's school. That's food for thought for you. All right? So, you know, I, I kind of bounce, you know, I say, yes, the chitta is there all the time. But sometimes I think on a mental level, there's a lot of, conditioning and there's a lot of thinking that is not in line with the right view right that's not in line with the the right renunciation or the right resolve and things like this and uh, maybe my speech isn't right so whatever it is you can it's it, the the noble eightfold path i don't think is really concerned with parami or perfections so to speak it's more about tuning everything right so it's in light so you can realize so the chitta can realize which is very different from the path of parami, which I guess is part of the Mahayana principle, right? Um, so the Noble Eightfold Path, as far as I'm concerned, sure it develops certain things, perfections and that, but it's not because it. it but it's not that as well because what it develops is acute awareness, acute focus, acute focus, right? On the on on realization, right? Because that's the goal of the Noble Eightfold Path, right? So, you know, there's some food for thought to maybe confuse you a little bit more. I guess people want answers to, to, for lack of, to, to clarify. But, you know, at least we clarify what the confusion is all about. Because we're talking about something that's hard to do. That's the other thing about this. The realization and reality of this is hard to do, for guys. It is hard to do for most people. Right? It's not easy to do. And when you think about the, the text, if you... If you dive into tech, you think there's millions and millions of arahants. <clears throat> there wasn't millions and millions of arahants. There were hundreds of thousands, I guess. Maybe there were millions, I don't know. But in the text, it's not so. You know, every meeting, I guess there's a thousand monks or 500 monks, a thousand, five hundred monks, arahants, whatever. Okay, but even then, you know, that's, that's, a, it's, if we look at our world's population, it's seven billion. Even if you have 10 million Arahants, is that a lot of arahants in the world at one time? You know, it's not a lot. It's a very small population, right? 
And the population of Singapore is 5 million, I guess. You know, it's it's a blimp in the world, right? It's very small. What what influence, you know, it's on the world does that make? It's it's very small. So, you know, it's under that and and this is over time too. Right? So this is very rare to do. It's hard to do. So get your mind around that too, you know, like realize that this is hard to do. Right? Um, there are monks who go to great efforts. You know, if you look at our, 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 I guess in my case, in Dhamma Yu, you look at our leader, Ajahn Man. <clears throat> now he used to go to caves, uh, caves where, you know, in those days where tigers would, would linger and, and, and roam. You know, you know, we, you look at that intellectually, you don't, you can't experience it. You don't understand. But you go to the forest and you go into a forest and you, you realize it's rainy, it's smelly. There's insects everywhere. There's mosquitoes everywhere. There's there's wasps everywhere. There's bees. There's all kinds of snakes and all kinds of critters everywhere. And when you walk into a cave, there's bats and bat droppings and there's rats and there's, there's again snakes and 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 there's squirrels and there's all kinds of stuff. And and caves are, caves are not you know these days you go into some caves that've been tiled down and 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 I guess refurbished, right? But in those days, they weren't, you know, and it's just dirt and it's smelly and they might have carcasses there, right? And that's where he used to go and spend nights there, you know, weeks there, months there. You know, he went to great efforts. He would only eat a little bit a day, you know, like he would go arms around and sometimes he would only get fed a handful of sticky rice. And as he would say, without without salt even, right? Now, he went to a lot of... Uh, uh, he went to a very hard, uh, I guess, a great, he went, put in some great effort and went to like a really, like, yeah, I would say, uh, what would be the word? Um, I guess extreme, but, you know, extreme, he went to an extreme effort. He put himself in extreme conditions and achieve it. But in Buddha's day, that was normal amongst a lot of monks too, until the temple started to get built. But if you look at the Buddha, he spent outdoors. Now, you try sitting outdoors. Try it. You know, go to your park even. You know, your park, you know, at least it's clean and, it, you know, you can sit on some grass. But try going into any forest place and sitting outdoors the whole day, whole night, and when it rains and things like that. Now get, let's get the, rom the, 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 the romantic notion out of it and start looking at it realistically. Right, what these people put, what these with these greats put themselves through in order to achieve, right, in order to realize, you know. And if you look at even uh, stories of the Arahants of this this century, last century, you look at their stories of, of the amount of efforts, you know, sitting and walking meditation all day, all night, you know, sitting sitting in cross-legged posture for seven days, ten days, ninety days, all these kind of things. Now, being secluded, sitting in a ca <clears throat> cave and just sometimes not even eating and things like this. And you, you don't have blankets, you don't have a sleeping bag, you know, all those kind of luxuries, right? We've got these really thin robes, you see, you can see through them, right? So it's not, it's not romantic. It's hard to do. And that's the, it's, that's the main thing that I'm trying to get across to you in this video is, is try to realize how hard it is. And what the Arahants actually do. Read their stories clearly and properly and put yourself into that situation. I get so many people, <clears throat> they come here, they, they, they really want to try. They spend one night in a little, in, in, a, in, in, a, um, in a dwelling and they need to get out. They can't stand it because all the mosquitoes and all the little critters everywhere and everything else that goes on, right? When you're living in the forest, you know, the centipedes as well, which I forgot, centipedes, oof. Right? There's all kinds of things that you got to deal with that you're not that you're not seeing when you when you actually go and try. And then on top of that, you need to find concentration. You need to develop concentration and develop the noble eightfold path while you're in that condition. And Ajahn Man used to do that on purpose because he put himself in difficult circumstances because he felt that it helped him to grow the most. <clears throat> so this is another thing. You know, you have to. Exp this is what solving the puzzle is. You have to solve your own puzzle. What will make you tick? You have to challenge yourself, right? So that's another thing to add to the pile of things to do, right? 
this is why I put myself in these different conditions too, because I'm, I'm in experimenting because I'm trying to see where I grow more, where I don't, you know, where I don't get lazy. You know, there are monks that move around a lot. There are monks that don't move around. There are monks that stay in the same temple from ordination date till death. But there are monks that move around, and then there are monks that are set that settle, etc., etc., etc. It all depends. It all depends, right? So the next thing I'll talk about now is hiriotopa, shame and fear of wrongdoing. Being shamed or shaming others or feeling shame, right? Now, feeling shame, believe it or not, is a very good solution to any other violent solution there is out there. Like, for example, ostracizing is actually much better than the alternatives, right? Being ostracized, being embarrassed in front of people. And I'll tell you why, because it beats getting beaten up, right? It beats getting put in, in jail. It, get, it beats getting um, violated or violently abused or mentally abused. Ostracized is actually the peaceful way to to correct bad behavior. Shame is actually healthy. Having a bit of shame or being shamed when you're doing when you're engaging in wrongdoing is actually good for the world in a lot. And it's the most peaceful way if you think about. It. If you look at the other alternatives to correcting behavior, so like for a child or in school or things like this, shaming works really, really well too. Right? Then you can you try the ostrac ostracizing and then banishing. <clears throat> As, as we do in the Vinaya, if, if the ostracizing doesn't work, if shaming doesn't work, then you banish the person. And, you know, that doesn't mean it's going to work. <clears throat> but once the person is banished, I think that's even worse than the prison cell. That's worse than hitting the person because mentally that person has to deal with the fact that they've been banished from a place for that type of behavior. That won't go away quickly in your mind, you know. So <clears throat> shame is a very healthy a very healthy thing to develop because it helps you to stay you know the shame of, of lying you know not of being deceitful or engage you know in stealing or trying to sexual misconduct or thing it's good to have a sense of shame about doing those be having engaging in bad behavior now fear of wrongdoing i guess it's the only fear that's worth having right out of all the other fears you know the fear of wrongdoing is not so much that uh, it's just the wrongdoing, it's the consequences. Now, that's what I want to talk about. It's the consequences, right? Consequences, accountability, right? Accountability and consequences to actions. So the fear of wrongdoing should be, you know, is, is, is working around the fact that, well, if I engage in wrongdoing, the consequences aren't going to be good. And that's a healthy fear. That's a very healthy fear. Now, in I guess in 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 in, in a, a Christian society, they say the fear of God is the well. I understand that, but the fear of wrongdoing is good too, right? So, the fear of wrongdoing is good because you're fearing the consequences, the retaliation, right? You're you're taking accountability for your action. In other words, you're trying to stop bad consequences or as best you can uh, you're trying to think about what the consequences are going to what the consequences will be to a wrong action <clears throat> right i wish someone to, i wish i knew this stuff really well in my in my when in my teens and in my 20s it would have stopped a lot of bad decisions <laughs> before i became a monk but really fear of wrongdoing is perhaps the only fear that's worth having because when you're aware of consequences and you hold yourself accountable, right? You walk. You you will do your best to do the right thing by yourself, for yourself, and for others, right? And engage in right action, which we've talked about before. So consequences, the fear of wrongdoing, like in, in shame and fear of wrongdoing, as in hiriotopa, are very very healthy healthy virtues to have and develop and cultivate throughout life. Why they're good for you and they're good for others. When people have shame and they have fear of wrongdoing, this protects, like the Buddha said, it protects the world. It's good for the world. Right? When people have fear of wrongdoing, they, they won't jump to hurting someone so quickly or saying things that are harmful or harsh or, or think even in your mind. The mind is the hardest thing where the mind uh, sits there and festers in, in you know, negative thoughts and, 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 and evil thoughts all the darn time. Right, so to clean that out, right? To clean that out is this fear of the consequence, right? The fear of wrongdoing, because 
there are consequences. There's retribution. <clears throat> so you're holding yourself accountable to what you say, to what you do, and what you think. Now, I don't think of anything healthier than that because that, you know, that pretty much, you know, looks after all your actions, even mentally, and helps you to helps you to purify your mind, your chitta, all your thoughts. It helps you to engage in throwing out the garbage mentally as well. And throwing out garbage behavior and throwing out garbage speech, speech that doesn't lead anywhere or speech that's just insulting and offensive um, or, you know, it's kind of condescending, you know, uh, you know, that leads to just conceited speech, right, or proud speech, things that are useless kind of verbiage that's useless. It's not helpful to yourself or anybody else. Who has to do... Where's your garbage truck? You know, where's your internal garbage truck? You know, mentally. And where's your verbal garbage truck, right? And where's your physical garbage truck? You know, you know, garbage behavior needs to be thrown out, right? So fear of wrongdoing and, and shame of wrongdoing as well, right? Having shame of doing the wrong thing. And, and, and it's not so much, um, it's different from feeling guilty. Now let's, let's not get these two mixed up okay let's make a distinction between feeling guilty and having shame having shame is right there and then when you've done something wrong with is to be is have a sense of shame about it because you know you could have done better or you could have done something more correct guilty is just tripping on it later you know what you've done before and just clinging to it and that doesn't help shame is just knowing oh that wasn't the right thing to do right that wasn't the right thing to do, but now I would do something else because in Buddhism we don't uh, we don't do the mia colpa, mia colpa, mia grandissima colpa, right? Like Saint Francis of Assisi whipping ourselves and putting, you know, the barbed wire around our our thigh, and, and every time we have lustful thoughts, we turn it around and it cuts into our leg. That kind of training is not what we do because that doesn't get rid of the mental aspect. You know, if you have a lustful thought and you hit yourself. That's not going to get rid of the lustful thought. The lustful thought needs to be dealt with where it is in the mind, in the chitta. It needs to be purified right there and then, and that's tricky to do. So when we when we um, when we clinging to bad actions from the past, what we're doing is festering in them and making them grow. We're making them become bigger and bigger and bigger than what they are, and we're taking away the power of now. That's why the past is irrelevant. It's what you're doing now. You don't want to take away the power and, and your capability and your strength now to continue to, to do wholesome deeds, to do the right thing now, right? So the past is the past. You, we, we have shame when we do, when we engage in wrongdoing or before we do engage in wrongdoing. That's the best, that way you don't do it. And you have fear of wrongdoing you know, because you're holding yourself accountable to consequences, right? Oh, these are all skillful behaviors as far as I'm concerned and are very useful for oneself and they and they're very good for everybody around you too when you have someone who's engaged who's practicing hiriotopa properly that's very good for the world it's very good for everybody else around you it's peaceful it's peaceful okay it leads to peace within too so all these things that um, we need to think about now that's why I'm coming back to intellect and it's not intellect alone, Fred, right? Because Alfred asked this question. By the way, shout out to Sakya Putta. Thanks for the donations. To Lawrence, thank you for the donations. Stephanie, thank you for the donations. Um, and whoever else, did I miss someone who's donated lately? Um, who else was there? I think I'm missing someone. Oh, thank you, Otomo, for, for past donations. For Otomo. Mark, thank you for past donations. Thank you to uh, Imanus uh, for past donations, uh, whoever's donated in the past. But uh, recently, thanks again, Sakya Putta, for those donations and Lawrence. Uh, really appreciate it. Um, they're going to um, a good cause. We're trying to rebuild this monastery here. So, uh, you know, if you want to donate, um, you can find it on my WordPress website, my free WordPress website. There's a donate. Uh, to the bank account here in Thailand, uh, and all those funds will go to this temple, right? And I'll use them to rebuild this temple. So if you want to donate, the chance is there. 
also the other thing I want to talk about sorry I just got off track but I think I've said I think I've said my piece on both I'll come back to intellect in a second but I got to I got to do my thanks and I got to do my um what's currently happening right so the the Buddha Buddhaksa this temple is called Wat Pa Buddhaksa but it's actually a hermitage that I'm working on right now and I have not officially accepted any positions here I'm just taking care of the place meditating here and uh, just living here and uh, and you can find out information on that site and Buddhists for Truth is a site that uh, I built with along with other people that I keep saying in every video uh, to create a center for Buddhism um, similar to Gab um, and we're doing it ourselves um, so you know it's got a lot of kinks and it needs a lot of improvement so a bit of patience there but uh, yeah help that grow that site that site is for Buddhists to come and talk about any pertinent um, uh, subjects or to, uh, to develop an online resource for Buddhists to come and talk to talk to monks or mo for monks too right so please engage in that and yeah I've reopened my telegram group for the time being I, I actually would prefer to do everything from Buddhist for truth but I understand this need for apps so I'll keep my telegram group open for a while but on the telegram group I have uh, a few groups I have a, a group for the temple which you can find on the website, which I do regular chanting once a week. Um, so yeah, and I do live streams and I look at questions, but I do read the comment section in this YouTube channel, though we only have a few, not many subscribers. Thank you for subscribing again. Thank you for liking the video. Um, yeah, but uh, what was I going to say? I lost my train of thought. The comments, that's right. Yeah, there's not many comments on YouTube, so, you know, but I do read them. I give you a nice heart, you know, that means I've read it. Um, so, but, uh, yeah, thank you for all the support. Anyway, for those people who um, who have, have, have supported this channel and supported me. And uh, thank you to those who have supported me since I became a monk. I'm not going to mention your names, but you know who you are. So coming back to intellect. So when we start off with intellect, are, are we talking about, just the normal daily intellect no that needs to be developed so whether intellect develops into wisdom who knows but the buddha does clarify particularly in the vipassana bhumi you can see there's a clarification between intellectual faculty and wisdom faculty so there's an actual faculty of wisdom in our chitta all right which is beyond the sixth sense as far as i'm concerned because it's in the chitta it's got it's not sixth sense sixth sense basis so these are deep things to consider and to chew on but again, it's hard, right? So let's consider this, um, you know, put yourself in reality. And, and like I said, you know, many times already in this video, come to the realization, come to the reality of how hard this actually is, right? How hard this is, this, this really is, right? So you say, uh, you know, lots of arahants. Okay, say there's 100 million arahants in the, in between, in the last century. There's 7 billion people. There's probably 8 billion people. It's been probably going up and down, who knows, over the last century or two. But is that a lot of people in the context of people? It's still not a lot. It's still not a lot because it's hard to do, right? Uh, because this is not talking about normal lifestyle. It's not talking about just an engineering degree, okay? An engineer gets a degree but then goes home, can watch TV after working eight hours, watch TV, eat three times a day, sleep, you know, sleep on the couch, that kind of, you can't, on this path, there's none of that, there's no days off, there's no watching TV or taking time out, you know, on this path, it's all about stringent effort, you know, constant effort until you get there, all right, so it's, this requires a whole different level, a whole different set of living conditions, you need to come to that reality, to, you need to adjust your reality, you got to see what time it is in New York language, you got to know what time it is, right, so, so yeah, anyway, I hope this video helps you. Um, and, uh, you know, till the next one, and may you grow in Dharma. Thank you for watching the video. If you enjoyed it, please subscribe and share with your friends.